time doth fly, the weeks they tumble down, and so we come to marvel at the half-blood prince's crown. Welcome, my muggle friends. I am the one known as Funky Monkey, and without further ado, let us continue the tale of Harry Potter into this sixth chapter, The Half-Blood Prince. Released in July of 2009, The Half-Blood Prince chronicles our hero's sixth and final year at Hogwarts. The Dark Lord finally begins to put his plans into action, and even that bastion of goodness, Hogwarts School itself, is no longer safe. So grab your wand, gird your loins, and do put a comb through that dreadfully messy varnish of yours, because we're about to meet the Half-Blood Prince. We catch up to our maturing mage in an underground cafe, but the prospect of an interesting evening is rudely interrupted by the unscheduled appearance of Professor Dumbledore. You've been reckless this summer, Harry. I like riding around on trains. Dumbledore takes Harry to see an old friend of his. But Horace Slughorn is no fool, and capitulates. Alright, I'll do it! Albus Dumbledore, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, the sharpest wand in the shop. Outside the Wild Weasley's joke shop, our tenacious trio spy the malcontent Malfoy ducking down a side alley, and follow. Even on the train, Harry suspects that Draco Malfoy is significantly less of a secondary antagonist. It was a ceremony, an initiation. But Malfoy is no fool. Didn't Mummy ever tell you it was rude to eavesdrop, Potter? And so, Harry settles into a sort of sixth form. Now how did that old muggle song go again? One of these things is not like the other. That evening, in Dumbledore's study, we take a look at the Professor's first meeting with a young lad called Tom Riddle. When I'm like you, Tom, I'm different. Different. Well, there were several ways to be different in the repressive 1950s. But Hermione doesn't take well to being second fiddle. This book is property of the Half-Blood Prince. Finding no references to a Half-Blood Prince, our trio step out for a tipple. And it's no coincidence that they run into Professor Slughorn. But on their way back, they witness an occurrence. Harry suspects Malfoy, but Snape is less convinced. The next night, Harry is invited to a discreet gathering with Professor Slughorn. As the others make their way into the night, Harry turns the conversation toward the ever-present Voldemort. Sir Riddle, he was a quiet, albeit brilliant boy committed to becoming a first-rate wizard. The sad truth is, my muggle friends, that heroes and villains are oftentimes more alike than they would ever care to admit. The plot reappears when Snape has a message for Harry, from Dumbledore himself. And so Christmas rolls around. The object that Draco is so interested in is a vanishing cabinet. But the Weasley Burrow is not the safe haven it appears. Bellatrix Lestrange leads our postgraduate protagonist across the fields, but Ginny follows. But shock! It was all a diversion! I could not say that I have ever lost my home. Still, Weasley clan, you have my sympathy. Spring term arrives, and Dumbledore has a very special mission for our hero. I want you to persuade him to divulge his true memory. But Slughorn is no fool either. Dumbledore put you up to this, didn't he? Luckily for Harry, he does happen to know a fool.
Still no luck with Slughorn, then, I take it. Luck. That's it. And so Harry takes a shot of liquid luck, discovers Slughorn, and goes to a grieving Hagrid. So passes Aragog, whose children tried to eat Harry and Ron in year two. Still, rest in peace, you crazy spider. Don't think badly of me when you see it. And so we discover the truth at last. A horcrux is an object in which a person has concealed part of their soul. To summarise then, a horcrux is an object that contains a part of a person's soul. The soul is split by the act of murder. Tom Riddle's soul has been split into seven pieces. That is not counting her... Um, yes, I'm getting ahead of myself there. Let us uh, swiftly move on. Harry and Dumbledore apparate to a mysterious cave, wherein they find one of the seven Horcruxes. And, unfortunately, its protectors. But one should never underestimate Albus Dumbledore. And so our heroes apparate back to Hogwarts. And so we come to it at last. Good evening, Draco. I have to kill you. For it is not Draco Malfoy that slew Albus Dumbledore. Have had a cadaver. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a moment for Albus Dumbledore. And now, let us finish this tale. And as Hagrid's cottage burns, the Half-Blood Prince is revealed. I'm the Half-Blood Prince. Thus do we close this chapter, as Harry makes the decision to leave Hogwarts, and seek the Horcruxes himself. Thus do we close this chapter, having known the Half-Blood Prince all along, and we return it once more unto the House of Love. Despite its dark ending, and the loss of so great a character, this is a surprising return to form for the series. The air is lighter, in spite of the darkness. The friendly tone and emphasis on the romances of the principal characters really makes this. Again, it's long, 147 minutes. But the pace only begins to drag as the upcoming execution approaches. And I can't have been the only one to notice the wobble in Snape's voice as he cast the killing curse. Overall, this is a surprising high point so late in the series, as we were beginning to get bogged down in the seriousness of the Dark Lord's return. We now have the means to defeat him. But as ever, we shall get to that. Yes, the beginning of the end looms large. Seven days hence. Let us reconvene at that time to uncover the Deathly Hallows. Spellcasting! D-I-S-M-I-S 